I am so excited to introduce you to today's phenomenal guests, Taran Rush and Jeff Biddle. I met Taran and Jeff when I visited West Virginia in December and was guided on a statewide tour of micro schools and similar emerging learning models uh, by Jamie Buckland of the West Virginia Few. The story of what Taran and Jeff have built and are continuing to build absolutely blew me away. I can't wait for you to hear it. Taran grew up in Charleston and was a star football player at Capitol High School, going on to play at the collegiate level at Eastern Michigan University. He decided to come back to Charleston after graduating in 2021 to make a positive impact on the youth in his neighborhood. He teamed up with Jeff, a pastor and mentor for Taran, to open a thriving sports-focused youth after-school program in Charleston. The duo now has their sights set on opening a low-cost private school in the same location as their after-school program to provide greater learning opportunities to Charleston's young people. Taran Rush and Jeff Biddle, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. And and so, Taran, maybe we could start with you and your experience um, going to Capitol High School, then going off to college, and then deciding to come back to build something um, new and different for the youth in your neighborhood and your community. What sort of inspired you to do that? Well, um, I'm going to have to say the word foundation. Uh, growing up on the west side of Charleston, um, the opportunities were slim to none, you know, but um, I always had good people in my corner like Jeff, you know, my family and friends and some community leaders. They kept me away from all the negativity. Um, I knew that coming back to the community to help and use my gift that God gave me to make this community better is something I always wanted to do, whether it was right after college or 10, 20 years later, I always going to come back on West Virginia was going to be my final destination. Um, having a community that uplift you and, and, push you to reach your goals, makes it so much easier to come back. Yeah, and so you came back and and built this after-school program um, where young people are able to come in anytime kind of after school and have a, a safe and nurturing space. When I visited, it's in a, a you know, community center location that you're that you're renovating with your own uh, your own work, your own efforts. And it has library spaces and places to gather, comfortable couches. It also has a, a, a basketball court, so kids are playing basketball. Um, there's a lot going on there, a weight room that you've recently renovated and opened. Uh, and you, I know you have more plans there, but that wasn't enough for you. You didn't want to just stop at an after-school program. You wanted something that could really be uh, an alternative for kids in the neighborhood and something that they could access. And so... Taran, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I know when we visited uh, in December, you talked about the story of your younger brother and some of the things that you were finding that he was experiencing uh, in the local public schools. And that was sort of part of your journey of thinking about creating something different. Could you share that story? Yes, ma'am. Um, it's been going on for many years before me. So um, it's a thing called a school to prison pipeline. And it's a it's a big thing that's happening in the public schools, but a lot of people don't really know about it. Well, um, my friends and I experienced this from elementary, middle school, all the way through high school. And really, it's just where a lot of the, the school system really don't understand a lot of the kids that come to school, their background. So the connection and the relationship is not there. So um, when you're young, you know, you, you do things in school, like maybe it might be something small as being a class clown or being late, um, they take extreme measure as suspending, kicking people out of school for little things instead of um, asking why are you late or why are you acting this way? And um, a lot of my friends have been in the prison system because of school. And in, the, in this community, we have a lot of people that's been locked up. Um, they've been taken away from people that love them, um, been taken away from their friends, been taken away from sports just because they made one mistake or made a couple mistakes. And, and all, all the school system could have did is sit down, have a conversation, ask that kid why he responded in this way or why he refusing to do these things. Um, so the school to prison pipeline is something that we're trying to beat, especially in our community. Um, and the idea of building a private school is to put our men in our community in a, in a safer space so, so they can grow. 
And also another thing is just um, the limited resources we have. You know, um, the idea of that, we want to be able to get our, our um, young men ready to be grown men, you know, whether it's um, teaching them the little things, you know, how to clean around the house, you know, or how to use the resources they have, you know, workshops and things like that. We want to incorporate all that to better our men um, for our community, to help our community grow in that, in that aspect. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up the school to prison pipeline um, and a lot of the sort of disciplinary measures that are taken in schools today that uh, contribute to that. I think when we visited, you mentioned that um, your younger brother had a day where he was facing the wall all day long and uh, and that that was just upsetting to you. I don't know if you can share a little bit more about that. Yes, um, in our, one of our um, local public school systems here in Charleston, um, we went up to visit the schools just to hang around and fellowship with the students there. And um, so happened to be, I was on the seventh grade floor and I just walked in a random classroom, not knowing my little brother was going to be in there or not. And when I walked in the room, you walk in, it was the students, it was desk like a square form. They all was facing the wall while the teacher was sitting in the, sitting in the back of the room. And, and the teacher didn't know my little brother was in there. And the teacher didn't know I had any connection with any of the students. I was just coming in observing. I said, how you doing? Um, I'm just coming to look around and, and make sure you need, if you only help with anything. Um, I was just sitting there for a little minute and um, the teacher start um, speaking to the kids. Like one of the kids asked to go to the bathroom and he responded, um, that's not your job. Your job is to sit, sit, face the wall and do your work. Um, we, we, these is 10, 11, 12 year old kids we talking about. Um, you shouldn't take the kids freedom away um, like that. And, it reminded me of a prison form, you know, um, and making somebody face the wall all day. This classroom uh, full of kids is a class that can't transition to other classrooms because they so-called don't know how to walk in the hallway. That's why they was put in the room. They got to sit in the same room and face the wall. They can't go to other classrooms. You know, they can't. They got the intramurals slipping away. Um, and you you see that at 10 years old. So just imagine what they're doing to a 10 year old's brain. You know, so that's and then you wonder why our kids are so rebellious to the school system because there's no relation. Um, it make you want to ask, would they make their kids sit and sit and face the wall at home? That that will make you that put the image in your head of an adult making a 10 year old face the wall. That, that just give me prison vibes and, and, and things like that. And I don't think that's healthy um, for our kids. And nobody should have to go through that, even if a kid is misbehaving. But I think it's other ways to to minimize that behavior instead of making them face the wall. Teach them what they did wrong. Have conversations. Yeah, so it really triggered me, um, because it hurt. It hurt me a lot because I've been through the things and also seen my friends go through it. So coming back and seeing that and nothing have improved, it really like put an anger in me. So it's really such a heartbreaking story, and I think all too common that um, kids are treated in this sort of prison-like school system. They are denied freedom. Um, and especially as you mentioned, these are 10 and 11 year olds, um, you know, they should be joyful, they should be uh, exuberant, um, you know, be able to be creative and explore their curiosities and instead, uh, their freedom is is dramatically restricted and they're in, in this, you know, really confined and, and as you mentioned, prison like experience. And so I'm so glad that you are building something better. And Jeff, maybe we can shift to you now and share, you know, kind of how you connected with Turan uh, and a little bit of your story. Your background is fascinating. You went to Harvard and then uh, came back to Charleston and worked with youth and met Turan uh, and have worked with him now to help realize this vision. Could you share a little bit about your background and story? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Carrie. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I uh, I went to Harvard, was an economics major, expected a career in finance. Uh, the Lord had other plans, uh, felt a call to ministry, uh, went and trained for ministry, and then came here to Charleston, West Virginia, where my family is from, although I didn't do most of my growing up here. And uh, Turan was one of the first people who I met. Uh, he was 11 years old at the time when I met him. And uh, long story short, uh, began working with the football team. Turan played football and then also with the basketball team at the uh, high school, at Capitol High School. And uh, I can only describe what Turan and his friends did as, as a movement. They began inviting more friends to come to church with them, to come do events with them. And... Um, 
looking from that from the point of view of a pastor and saying, okay, how do I equip these young people who obviously have um, some passion about them, um, about what they want to do? Um, and we we found the Christian Community Development Association, uh, John Perkins, a ninety about ninety year old uh, civil rights leader, founded the CCDA. It's called. And um, one of the things he says is work with the middle schoolers in, in the community and as they grow, support them, uh, make sure they have the resources to reinvest and their lived experiences will tell you what the community needs next. And so as Taran and his friends got older, that was what was in my mind saying, okay, fellas, what do you see that needs to happen so that this community can thrive? And so as Taran has described, some of the experiences that they went through sort of informed their decision making about opening first this community center with kind of a network of sports programs related to it, uh, and then moving on to the idea of opening a school. That's great. So Jeff, tell us about the current community space. Um, it was really worn down when you uh, when you go, finally you know first moved in. You've done some tremendous renovations. What was it about that space, that location that you liked, and uh, and what have you done so far to renovate? And what's next? Well, it was uh, um, uh, I guess a few years back when a couple of Taran's buddies sat me down and said, "We really need a physical space to continue this work in." And again, this has been all their vision. Uh, I'm just hopefully a good listener and a good equipper. And so they 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 sat me down. And uh, one of the things we knew we would need was a building with a room that was tall enough and with a single span uh, ceiling to hold a basketball court. So that actually narrowed it down to only four sort of formerly industrial buildings for sale here on the west side. And the one we're sitting in here was very close to the middle school. Um, it was in okay shape. It hadn't been sitting empty that long. Uh, I'd say okay shape. There was plenty of what we needed to do. And so it was square run, square one. Uh, just started fundraising, ended up uh, raising almost $500,000 the first year and another five hundred dollars the next year. That's both for renovations and, and for programming. And so it was really, it was, it was from the ground up. I mean, Taran and his buddies laid the gym floor. You know, it's one of those snap together floors and they were in there one morning, you know, laying that down. We had to have professionals do things like hang the baskets or, or you know, add HVAC, that kind of thing. But it's been a really uh, build the plane while you fly it type of journey uh, driven by the energy that these uh, young adult folks have to create a safe space for the community here. Yeah, and this industrial location has two buildings, right? So you have the building that has the community center in it that has the basketball court, you're renovating that. But there's also right across the, the, the parking lot, another more dilapidated building that you're eyeing up uh, for this school, this vision of, of something more than just an after school program. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, some of the challenges that if you wanted to open right now as a school, a micro school or some other kind of daytime learning program in your existing space, why that seems difficult at the moment, why that's not possible. Yeah, um, so there are definitely code issues. Um, you know, s some of what's created in terms of code is very important. You always want people to be safe. You want to be safe in, a, in an emergency situation like a fire or somebody having a medical emergency. But other forms of those code issues seem often either tangled or um, or, or sometimes they're not comprehensible. Uh, they seem to be almost in conflict with each other, and it's almost up to the interpretation of whoever you know you happen to be working with at the moment. And there's no guarantee that's going to be the next person's interpretation. And so you feel kind of this tension between uh, you, you want safety, you want that kind of thing, but you also don't want to sort of knock out 95% of the spaces where education support could be happening in a city, you know, based on codes that weren't necessarily written for the purpose that is being applied. And so, for instance, there's a lot of confusion about people's ability to use homes, you know, could six students meet in a home if that home wasn't built, you know, as a structure originally meant to be institutional? We kind of all believe on a base level, you know, a parent should be able to organize a little group of students and give help. Community support is really what makes education possible. Um, but at this time, 
uh, interpreting what might or might not be permissible from a building standpoint, uh, it, it can be a pretty significant barrier. Yeah, and, and, and it's true everywhere. Uh, you know, this is a, a challenge of education entrepreneurs in all states, um, certainly the ones that I've spoken to, where, you know, there, there do seem to be these sort of um, unfair regulations and sort of different applications that don't make much sense. For example, you can have after school programs like yours or tutoring centers or gymnastic academies that are able to operate under sort of general business licensing in the afternoons. But then if you switch from sort of three to nine to nine to three, somehow now you're opened up into educational occupancy and some other, all of these other hoops that you have to jump through. And it really can prevent a lot of education entrepreneurs from starting and scaling uh, their, their programs. So for you, you decided, you know, we're not going to try to retrofit this existing community center building. We're going to keep that as the after school youth program. That's working well and meeting all codes for that. Uh, and we're just going to start renovating from the ground up this uh, adjacent or sort of semi-adjacent building across the way. Uh, and so I wonder, and I'll go back to you in a minute, Taran, but Jeff, if you could just wrap, wrap up here with sort of what is your time kind of timeline for building up that uh, other building that's across the way? So uh, I, I would have to defer some of this to, to architects and people who know more than I do, but we do hope to be open in the fall of 2024. And uh, so to have at, at least an, enough space that is appropriate for our purposes to open up then, um, it has been a bit of a, 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 a marathon, not a sprint, in terms of uh, doing all the work and understanding what work needs to be done. Uh, but that's the goal, uh, to be able to open next fall. That's incredible. And I'll try to share some pictures because I think if my listeners and viewers could see uh, what that building looks like, thinking that this, this is going to be this gorgeous space and in just a year and a half is really remarkable because it's this abandoned warehouse at the moment. Uh, so exciting to see what's going to go in there. And Taran, now to you. So in the in the fall of 2024, when this gleaming new building is is ready to welcome lots of students, it's actually quite a large space. Thankfully for you, uh, you know what do you what do you see coming out of that first year for the youth in in this uh, you know in your program? What are you hoping that they gain from this new school? Um, I'm hoping that they gain a, a solid education for one. Um, that's the most important thing. Um, and also just a space to grow and be safe, you know, and, and fellowship and dwell together, you know, and also um, we're trying to incorporate um, having sports teams as well, because we know a lot of a lot of kids that grow up in this community um, does play sports. And we're just trying to give them a platform and the resources to help them reach the next levels and goals that they want to attain, you know. So that's that's what I that's what I see out of the first year. You know, so. Yeah, and West Virginia uh, is one of the leading states now in uh, implementing education choice policies, the new HOPE scholarship program there that allows uh, um, almost all, it's a near universal education savings account program uh, enabling families in, in West Virginia to access around $4,500 per year per student uh, to use in a micro school, a low cost private school, um, tutoring programs, educational therapies, and so on. Uh, and so that I imagine is what's going to help increase access to your program. How did school choice policies kind of tie into your vision here? Yes, it's definitely, um, definitely going to help incorporate um, for the school. Um, and I think that was wonderful that, that they got passed because given a person the opportunity to choose what education they want, that's freedom. You know, some people can't thrive in certain um, environments. So, so some people need different education opportunities. And I think um, what we're offering is, is something that is going to impact our community, um, that anybody that can fit in the description that can come is, is always welcome. You know, we, um, we're trying to reach a certain population and a certain group of people um, that can fit our education style and, and fit what we bring it to the table. And we want to offer that because, like I said, um, around here for a long time, the resources have definitely been slim to none. And we just want to provide opportunity. When you get opportunity, the world is yours. 
Well, I imagine that there'll be a long line of people um, wanting to take advantage of what you're building and provide a much more joyful, much more, you know, academically focused and sports focused environment for kids um, that is nurturing and that, def you know, prevents and, and stops the school to prison pipeline. Uh, you know, do you have, when you think about sort of 10 years from now, Turan, do you think that you could potentially put more of these programs in Charleston and, and maybe elsewhere around West Virginia or even nationally to help more kids? Yes, sir. Um, yes, ma'am, I apologize. In 10 years, I don't know uh, where we will be at, but it's always good to dream big. But um, I think it's easier just to follow what God got in store. You know, sometimes I like to focus on the right now and what we got in front of us. So in 10 years, hopefully, if, that, if that's what God want, wants um, us to do, then it'll be. But if not, whatever we got right now, that's the main focus. So. Well, and, and I think whether or not you're building these additional schools, you'll certainly be inspiring others to do something similar in their communities. And Jeff, I wonder if you can talk about kind of what you see as the future uh, for youth in Charleston and, and maybe elsewhere around West Virginia. Um, I think reinvestment is the key word. Um, Appalachia as a whole is a place that struggles economically. And um, I really truly believe it's the people within the community who are best equipped uh, to move the community forward. And yet so many of our young people feel they have to leave, even if they don't want to. And uh, so we're certainly wanting to see a generation of young people who feel equipped to reinvest in the community that has raised them exactly the way that Turan and his friends are doing. Um, we really want people to come out of high school feeling uh, that they've been given the tools they need to succeed and the tools they need to uh, succeed in an interdependent way uh, with the people they love and the people who are around them. And uh, seeing the way that Turan and his friends have moved so quickly and so powerfully uh, to make a reinvestment of their own, it certainly makes me hopeful uh, that that could be multiplied, that there could be dozens more uh, folks who feel that they have what they need to make that a reality. I was just asking Turan, you know, if you had had access to something like the program you're building as a child, um, what would that have been like? Obviously, you know, sports is a key issue for a key priority for the new school. It was certainly a big part of your life growing up uh, in football. So that's going to be retained. But I wonder how else being in this kind of a learning environment that you're building for others might have impacted you if you had the opportunity to go through something like that. Um, I will have to definitely say just the experience um, that we that we that my friends and I had to go through. Uh, a lot of us um, have been successful and was able to get through uh, the schools that we was, was at and um, graduated from. But like I said, if we could have avoided the experience of, you know, how we was treated while we was going through school, that was something that was something I wish um, that I could have that could have been changed. Um, that was really the hardest thing, you know, seeing my friends get locked up, me getting in trouble or, or getting looked at different because of the environment I come from. If we could have dodged that, um, that would have been a blessing. But but um, it's, it's good that we was able to go through that so we can prevent that for the upcoming uh, youth. So Jeff, as you think about the mechanics of the school, obviously has this extraordinary vision. It's going to really change lives for many students in the Charleston area. How are you working on some of the, the mechanics around curriculum decisions? You know, do you have a certain educational philosophy or approach from an academic perspective that you're uh, considering? Tell us a little bit about what goes into building a school academically. Yeah, sure. Um, so we definitely want this school to be a place um, that students can come out equipped to lead, um, equipped for social leadership, leadership within the community. Um, and so that's going to mean both a humanities foundation and a STEM foundation. Uh, we want to emphasize both of those things. Um, and we, we want the education to be of a style that encourages uh, the young folks to express themselves, even debate. You know, there, there can be some schooling environments where it's really kind of like if you learn these eight things and you write those eight things down on a quiz, we did it. You know, we want to be a lot more discussion based than that, um, framing uh, the issues, both big and local, um, that are going to determine what kind of leadership these young people want to offer. And um, 
The connection with sports is another thing. We actually contribute to research that um, uh, that's really exciting about sports and trauma healing. Um, we, we've been working with a, a professor who um, does work on human dignity and conflict resolution. And uh, when you're working on the school to prison pipeline issue, it's a form of sort of social conflict resolution. And the idea that violations to human dignity can be traumatizing. And so uh, the experiences young people are having within the schools can be traumatizing. And the research showing how athletics um, creates a different learning environment to uh, approach challenges in a safe way and then find ways to connect with other people to solve those challenges is directly healing to the kind of trauma that young people are experiencing in school and community. And so the connection between the growth in leadership and the sports participation for the school is something that, that we have a lot of science behind, a, a lot of psychology behind how we believe we can create an environment that um, that, that is holistic, that those things are going hand in hand. Oh, just incredible. Uh, you know, so Turan, you're building something new and different and better, right? You're, you're, you're criticizing by creating. Uh, which is just so inspiring. And I, again, will be such an impact, a positive impact on the youth in your city. Um, I'm curious, though, do you, you know, when you think about American education more broadly and, and public schools across the country, especially um, urban public schools, you know, do you think that there can be meaningful change within the system? Or do you think that it's entrepreneurs like you building something out of the system that's really going to have uh, the most dramatic impact? Um, I think it can be changed within a system. It just you gotta you gotta try to learn new things and try to grow because I think a lot of the schools around the world, especially America, um, we get judged off test scores. You know, we all um, I think um, kids is more than numbers, and and uh, putting a test in front of a kid is is not knowledge. You know, um, kids are smart in different ways, and certain kids know. Um, are interested in certain things, you know. So I think the school system in America need to need to stop judging the kids off of test scores and judge and and judge them off the knowledge that they know and the, and the knowledge that they can attain. You know, um, having a I didn't test how on an ACT score. I'm a college graduate, you know. So that's one of those things where I think America need to stop um, looking at kids and numbers and, and looking at kids and just helping them gain knowledge. I couldn't agree more. And of course, the trend is the opposite. The trend is moving to, toward more standardized testing uh, for, for youth. And I think that's actually driving a lot of uh, families to seek additional options outside of an assigned district school, that they want something that looks at children more holistically uh, instead of just a test score. And it's what's driving other education entrepreneurs like you both to create these new models that again, look at that the whole child and not just a number, as you say, Taran. So Taran, what advice do you have for other uh, aspiring education entrepreneurs, people who might be um, fascinated by your story and now wanna go off and do something similar? What advice would you have if they wanna create a similar school to your vision? Um, the advice I got for them is to, to dream big because, and don't, don't be scared to, to try to make change, you know, don't be um, scared to be different. Um, it's okay to be rebellious against the system. Um, if you're doing it in a positive manner, if you're trying to make a positive change, you know, don't be scared to do it because um, if you got to follow your dreams and follow the vision, especially if you know your community, if you understand your community, don't, don't be scared to make change in a positive way. Just do it. You know, um, that's, that's the advice I have because, you know, sometimes you might be scared to go against the, the board of education or the school systems. If you understand your community and you know what your community needs to be successful, just go do it. Right. And, and we mentioned earlier that the Hope Scholarship Program, the School Choice Program in West Virginia is really going to help education entrepreneurs like you um, to build these new models because now families have access to more funding to choose different education options. You know, how important do you think school choice policies are in uh, catalyzing the supply of some of these new programs? Um, like I said earlier, um, giving a family the opportunity to choose what education they think is best for their kid, that's freedom. Like I said earlier, like their, the parents know what their kid needs and how their kid learns. You know, so that whole scholarship is everything. Um, 
you don't and also like a kid don't need to be in school for eight hours if a kid only needs four hours um three days a week if that's good for that family that's what they should be able to have access to that for their, for a their kid you know everybody's lifestyle is different so i think um the whole scholarship is, is a tremendous thing that's happening for the state Yeah, just disrupting this old way of doing things with schooling that, you know, you don't have to necessarily be at school all day long, um, kind of five days a week doing this standardized curriculum and, and moving through that, that um, kind of conveyor belt model that there's all kinds of different ways that education can be approached. And it's, again, entrepreneurs like you who are building those new models and, and giving uh, uh, students and families so much more access to possibilities. Jeff, what do you think? You know, what, what advice do you have for other uh, prospective education entrepreneurs who want to build the learning models for tomorrow? Huh. Um, it's a lot of work, uh, but it's worth it. Um, if you love and care about the young people in your community, uh, listen carefully to what they and their families are saying about uh, what their needs are, what their hopes are, what their challenges are. And um Creating an alternative structure, uh, that in and of itself is a real challenge, but for the thriving of our young people, it's worth it. So if uh, my listeners and viewers want to help support your efforts and uh, and connect with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Well, um, anybody is welcome to visit uh, the website of the Midian Leadership Project. That's www.midianproject.com. Um, and so uh, that is the, the website for the nonprofit that is operating this community center here and that is incubating the new school. And uh, so you can get to know us a little bit better there. Anyone if wanting to make a financial contribution can do so there. And, and if you want to contact us, uh, you can find a contact page on that website as well. Taran Rush and Jeff Biddle, so exciting what you're building. I cannot wait to see what comes of this new school in the fall of 2024 and the incredible opportunities you're providing for young people in Charleston even before that happens through the after school program. Thank you both so much for being on the Liberated podcast. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for having us.